Okay, we're ready to go, Jacob. I'm here too. Perfect. Um, so we'll call the um, cannabis uh, control board sustainability subcommittee to order at 12.03 p.m. Uh, on the call today, we have Kyle Harris from the CCB. Um, Kyle, do we have any members of the public with you today? We've got one member of the public in the room with me. Uh, sounds good. We also have um, from the subcommittee uh, Jacob Halter, Stephanie Smith, and Billy Coster from NACB. We have Gina Cranwinkle and Tom Nolasco. Um, okay, so we will um, postpone approving the meeting minutes. Um, and we'll do it via email like we did last time. Um, I will send this out to everyone as soon as I get it into a um, editable Word doc. Um, so keep an eye out for that hopefully later today uh, from our last meeting on the 20th. Um, so for today's meeting, um, we're just gonna kind of review some outstanding items that we've discussed in previous meetings. I just kind of sent out a more detailed agenda than when Elliot posted um, a few minutes ago to everyone. Um, and to kind of start this up, actually, Kyle, um, kind of give the floor to you real quick. I know you um, started to submit um, some overarching kind of outline to the rest of the CCV, so I wanted to see if there's anything, um, any updates to that or, or anything before we get started today. Right. No updates. Everything was, was passed without too much consternation or, or discussion, rather. I think everybody kind of recognized that there's additional application, um, and I can forward you the slide decks that we that we looked at and approved, but this was, um, Billy, thank you so much for your help on on-site water and wastewater and then hooking up to municipal water um, and wastewater systems and what should be expected and what folks need to do from a local utility, local municipality perspective to include in their application. And I think we arrived at a consensus um, that the board can kind of develop a form letter to, to distribute out to local utilities and municipalities that kind of expedites um, you know, that part of the process. We also, and, and Stephanie, a lot of what we are looking at is pretty similar to the hemp program. I, I literally thought the way you guys do things was was great looking for GIS coordinates latitude longitude that type of that type of stuff it's those basic understanding where your site is and how we can make sure we know specifically where your site is um, in addition to requiring that I did also asked I, I asked the board for approval on um, somebody drawing their cultivation site in addition to providing coordinates um, and you know with a scale with a, a north arrow um, just so we understand the the property and where the site will be on property in addition to having those those coordinates knowing what you plan to do on your property um, within the bounds not just of your your total canopy site but if you're drying there where the drying facility is so on and so forth um, and I'll forward around that slide deck um, we also did talk about a, uh, a ways to, in our authorizing legislation, we need to figure out, figure out ways to prioritize uh, licenses when we do receive them. One of the six um, required um, buckets of us is sustainability. So I started to put some thoughts on paper to help uh, kickstart a discussion on what sustainability would look like. And I think what the board's interested in is refining those thoughts into kind of a scoring matrix that can kind of help guide discussion and an understanding of cultivation practices, plans for um, the future, whether or not you're willing to be audited, all those all those kinds of things. And that was very conceptual um, from a board perspective on Friday. No decisions were really made. I think they like the, the direction that that's going to go and we're going to continue to talk about that in addition to the other six or other five um, buckets. And these are anywhere from your social equity status to um, you know, whether you're in good standing with, you know, other state agencies, there's, there's different, I, I don't have a list in front of me, I apologize, but this, this sustainability concept of understanding, um, you know, how, how you intend to cultivate um, will mean something. And we've also kind of discussed recognizing that the priority license might mean something for this go around, um, but what, what's the impact and what's the benefit to it once we kind of our market starts to be a little bit more mature because if there's not this bottleneck of 
of applicants coming in, it might not be worth it to give us that information. So we did talk about developing like a gold star program or another sustainability program within um, the board that will mimic and look at, uh, you know, stuff like, I know you're working with, uh, on the hemp program, Stephanie, that informal Vermont brand, how we can um, kind of let certain cultivators take advantage of, of the practices that they intend to employ. So that, that was a gist of what we discussed as a board, and, and I can forward that slide deck around it. I think it's on our website already, but I'll forward it to, to everybody here uh, later today. Perfect. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Stephanie, do you have any questions for Kyle right now? Um, just on the municipal water issue, um, I believe within a zoning code or zoning regulation, there is a requirement at the permitting level, at the municipal level, to get um, approval for water and wastewater. So it kind of is packaged and rolled in at the municipal level. And, and so I just wanted to make you aware of that at the CCB, Kyle, because um, your request a operator or permittee or licensee, um, you may be able to get that information in one full scoop at the municipal yeah. level. Good enough. Thank you, Stephanie. Perfect. Okay. Um, Billy? Well, sounds good to me. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so then we'll move on to, to kind of pesticides since we didn't cover that in the last area. Thank you, Stephanie, for kind of sending me the, the quick notes of um, what the HEP program is doing. Um, so I kind of wanted to uh, talk about that and kind of see, I guess, Stephanie, from your perspective, um, what, if you're thinking that's adequate to just use as the basis for um, the uh, cannabis um uh basis i guess and so it looks like all products that are going to be used for pesticides need to be um uh, what's it called registered in vermont and yeah so yeah vermont has its own individual registration program for pesticide products um so yes yeah. okay. <laughs> um do you know if vermont kind of has small local um kind of like pesticide companies um, using kind of uh, different, you know, uh, essential um, oils and things like ingredients that would be um, allowable, but maybe haven't gone through the registration process. Um, just I don't know. Um, I personally, um, I, I don't participate in the registration of pesticides. I, I do operate within that division within the agency. Um, so I don't know of small companies that are otherwise creating pesticides um, and haven't made it through the Vermont registration process. Um, so I don't have an answer to that. Um, but certainly, I mean, we have a robust pesticide program within the agency. Um, we have inspectors and they know what they're looking for relative to <laughs> pesticide use and misuse. <laughs> I know, I, know they're, I, know they're in the I was just going to say, I know that they're in the process of updating those right now, too, right, Stephanie? Yeah, the regulations are being updated, but it doesn't necessarily change the, the pesticides that are permitted to be used. It's just all the licenses and um, registrations, you know, just the licenses that an individual needs in order to apply a pesticide. Um, or to retail or sell a pesticide, uh, the fact that they need to be um, have a, a pesticide uh, pass the various tests. There's the core test, and then there's the particular types of pesticide applications that have their own individual tests, as well as how you store those pesticides um, and uh, what you deal with uh, when you're mixing a pesticide in a particular area and what you need to do if they're just disposable, but not specifically that's the product. Gotcha. Um, okay. Um, with, so if I'm understanding correctly, the hemp pesticide list right now is done on a product and ingredient basis. So the product needs to be registered, but the active ingredient needs to be on this approved list. So actually, so this was the hemp guidance prior to EPA taking action to approve specific pesticides for use on hemp. 
So now, so this is this is what we use prior to EPA actually having labeled products for specific use on hemp. But this is the list that would apply to medical cannabis and likely in the future to recreational cannabis, cannabis because EPA does not approve a pesticide for use on cannabis <laughs> and it will be on the label. But if there is a label, there, they do have labeled um, pesticides now. So this, this was the list and this is the list for cannabis specifically. And so we don't do it on a product by product basis, we do it on an active ingredient basis because we couldn't possibly capture or encapsulate all the products that might meet these requirements. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Would your department be interested in doing um, a product list? I know Colorado has that now because there's a lot of confusion with active ingredients. So that list does exist. And other yeah, states. I I think we don't want to because then people petition the agency to get products on the list. We've not we've actually received positive feedback with respect to this guidance and I know Maine has similar guidance to this. So I think we're gonna stay in this this lane, this bucket for how we'll treat pesticides. Um, not to say that we wouldn't otherwise a uh, conversation couldn't happen with anybody. I mean, certainly we would be willing to, to, to do technical assistance relative to this list with anybody that had to worry. Okay. Um, that sounds good. And then as far as the um, shall not leave residue and the tolerance exception from the, um, I think, what is it, the Food Drug Cosmetic um, Association, those are just kind of standard. Like, do we need to go into anything? I mean, it seems pretty relevant for cannabis. Just wondering if that I, needs further conversation or not. You know what? Again, my experience with this list prior to EPA coming out with um, pesticides listed for hemp or approved for use on hemp, we've had success with this list. Um, and, and they're most, I can't, I mean, Carrie would have more information with respect to this, but again, this has been a, a pretty effective tool um, for the agency. And again, we would, we would be happy to entertain a discussion and as new information becomes available regarding pesticide use on cannabis, especially on inhalable um, cannabis, we are always willing to amend this list and or um, have this conversation. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess the last kind of question I have would be um, direction on when some of these uh, ingredients that like, can be used. Um, or has Vermont thought about um, putting guidelines on for when, like spraying a pesticide can be used during flowering? Um, because some, some states have that, some don't on like uh, a week before harvest or not at all during flowering, like that kind of um, guidance. Has, has your department kind of talked about that? We haven't, but that's a good idea. So we'll certainly consider that and we'll bring that um, forward. Stephanie, okay. Stephanie, just for your knowledge on this specifically, Bryn has asked me to bring recommendations on pesticide usage and application to the full board on Friday. Because um, we're starting to, starting to really move uh, aggressively with, with trying to get a direction for, for the way we want rulemaking to go. So do you and I need to have a, a one-off conversation at some point this week on that? Or, you know, we can talk about it on, on Thursday as a board. Um, my list is getting long in the teeth <laughs> that I need to present yeah. on Wednesday and on Friday. But pesticides are, are one of them. So um, how we want to pr- handle that would, yeah, and I can, I can, if I'm not rushing this decision by any stretch. I'm just trying to mirror it to some of my timelines that we're going to be talking about as a board, and I can always request that that be pushed to next week. We're going to this Wednesday, Friday board meeting schedule um, now, so um, just putting it on your radar. Yeah, so I, I think from a rulemaking perspective, I mean, there's a couple approaches that the Cannabis Control Board could take. They could let the agency regulate pesticide use on cannabis which we currently do with medical, which would eliminate a lot of work on your end, Kyle. <laughs> Let the agency regulate. <laughs> um, and then uh, the other idea is, um, or just for consideration, is that in rulemaking, you know, not, not that you want to be flexible, because you want to be clear. Um, and again, we have a pesticide rule um, in the Agency of Agriculture um, 
I guess that's rel again relative to practitioners and storage and whatnot. But um, we can, uh, I, if you put it in rule, then you have to go through a fairly laborious process um, to change that rule. So I, I'm just, you know, with respect to this particular request that Jacob just made, you know, when to use any of these active ingredients on a on a cannabis crop, like that doesn't need to be in the rule, in my opinion, um, only because, again, recommendations may change, new information may become, come forward, and, you know, we should have some flexibility to be able to ensure the health, safety, and welfare as that new information comes forward. So, um, that's all I got. <laughs> that makes sense. So, I have a question for you on the, um, the uh, lab testing uh, committee, has there been discussion or agreement yet on what the requirements are going to be, the limits for um, pesticide residue for like, lab testing? I know Bryn had a conversation with Carrie and Kim Watson on Friday, and I need to follow up with Carrie because another one of their requests of Bryn for me to talk about on Friday is lab testing. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's coming fast and furious. Um, I'll get that. you and I should just have a conversation sometime this week. Gotcha. Yeah. So then that will see if it's necessary to put in recommendations or any kind of guidance on when to spray because if you guys are setting the lab testing limits kind of at zero for any kind of pesticide, then you know, you're not gonna be able to you know, spray during flower at least, you know, kind of a few weeks or a month before harvest. So um, I think all of that kind of interplays. Okay. Good, good. Um, that's good what you guys are testing for and what those limits would be. Uh, and Kyle, you have a copy of what we require for limits on hemp, correct? I believe so. Okay, we have action limits outlined for that. If I can't find it all um, um, Yeah, go ahead, go, sir. I would just say, Stephanie, if I have trouble finding that, I'm sure you sent it to me over the last week or two, uh, but I'll let you know if I can. Yep. And we also have a spreadsheet for how we arrived at what we had, as well as the various resources we used. And then there's a couple of websites um, that are out there that kind of outline the state um, of testing across the country, I believe. Perfect. Um, all right, so then I guess we can move on to the waste discussion, which we kind of um, I look back through our, kind of our meeting minutes and, and where we're at, and it seems like we kind of stalled a bit without knowing where the CCB was going to be classifying cannabis waste in general. Um, so I was wondering if there has been more movement on that. Um, so is cannabis waste, um, like organic material, packaging, et cetera, going to be classified specifically as like hazardous waste or um, like uh, restricted waste, or is it um, kind of down to us to help give recommendations. I was wondering kind of where that conversation has gone with the other committees. Uh, as far as I know, it's there hasn't really been a whole lot of substantive conversation, but I would suggest that this committee make a recommendation on how to treat it, and I'll have to bring it to the full board, and that's something I have to do on this coming Wednesday. So a recommendation would be fantastic. Okay, so what we had, I believe, agreed upon for at least organic material was that we were going to classify it as a commercial organic material um, uh, for the like stocks and root balls and all of that. Um, I don't think that we actually went into um, how we're going to be classifying active ingredient material. So, so that would be. Um, from the issue of like manufacturing edibles that have uh, kind of already decarbox decarboxylated cannabis so that it's you know an active ingredient and should be restricted on some level because um, that's what could you know potentially be got in the hands of uh, kids etc and what's suggested could lead to or will lead to you know psychoactive effects so i was wondering um what people were thinking about um in regards to that kind of restrictions um, in uh, yeah in the, in the waste stream. You know, other states have gone through the unrecognizable and useless procedure of mixing at fifty percent. Um, I know that we had talked about that not being necessary for the organic side of things. Wondering um, 
what kind of we were thinking about in regards to to that kind of wage stream. Um, if anyone kind of has any ideas or uh, yeah, we can kind of discuss it all out. Could you just clarify what the kind of non-organic component of that waste stream would be? So I guess it would be organic waste, so it would be concentrates and things that would be left over from waste cartridges um, and anything in kind of the manufacturing process, but that would be processed. Gotcha. Yeah, so it'd be processed, flour, um, so like distillate and live rosin, resin, so anything that's been um, like heat activated um, so that it turns the THC A into THC and then um, would need to be, you know, somewhat destroyed. So I think it's a product that's either been contaminated or didn't pass has pain or went off the lab facilities um, that then would be you know, collected and needing to go somewhere that most likely should not be just thrown away, uh, which it needs to be tracked, one, in, in metric or whatever, track and trace system, uh, but that needs to, yeah, kind of be uh, either chain of custody, like very robust chain of custody, or destroyed and rendered, you know, un un unusable. And, and then I would say that the next level of that would be the collection of um, post-consumer waste that could potentially contain these materials. So I just, uh, and to further tease out what Billy asked, um, so this affects labs that are doing testing and who have material left over that they actually just need to get rid of because they don't even hold on to it anymore. <laughs> um, manufacturers that have failed batches and or some whatever, let's just call it failed batches, and then the consumer is the third kind of group that yeah, you need to address from a yeah. post-consumer basis. Okay. Yes, you have labs, I would say manufacturers. Um, you would also have, um, I would say, retail outlets. So um, product that has you know, gone down the expiration date. Um, and there's potential, I would say, for distribution distributors as well, like if it's been stored improperly and then might pose a public safety issue. Um, so I'd say like everyone kind of in the supply chain of a you know, finished activated product, which would be probably topicals, concentrates, and edibles. Is, is the CCB considering requiring expiration dates as a part of the labeling? And are those, I mean, I just don't know enough um, about that. Expiration. And expiration will be out there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Expirations will be on the product. Sure. And are you guys doing it in the year with manufacturing? Mm hmm. With the manufacturing date and the expiration date. So, yeah, I mean, I would say, and I'd have to do a little bit more research on there, but it does seem like these products, this type of stream, does need to be. Um, uh, stored and collected in a like governed process. Um, so usually that includes, um, you have some kind of partnership with like a hazardous waste collector that will, um, you know, oversee this, you know, have training on it and either gets, um, for the most part, I think it's like incinerated um, or yeah, um, not just landfilled is, is my understanding. If, uh, yeah, it looks like this has not been necessarily uh, done in other committees. We can sort this through. I think at a later date, I can come up with some like what other uh, states are doing with this. But I believe it is um, overseen in an uh, unrecognizable and useless, uh, rendered useless process. If, if you can come up with like different um, disposition standards, like that one, I can certainly reach out to our cell waste both to see what opportunities exist within landfills, composting, and hazardous waste haulers currently in Vermont to kind of manage waste streams to that endpoint. 
Um, so that could help inform the, the conversation, but it would be good to just have a kind of what the options might be so I could go and ask the question. Okay, yeah, will do. Because I know like for the, the composters, for instance, can render products unuseful so that they are clear, you know, they can demonstrate to the producer that it's been destroyed to the point where it can't be resold because there's certain processors who need that assurance. That doesn't deal with the public safety issues, but, um, you know, even for, even, my point is that even for composting, there may be the ability to get to that standard depending on what exactly the standard is um, we're shooting for. Gotcha. And I do believe that there is research out there that shows that um, activated THC compost, it actually, it does break down. So it won't be like in the leachate or anything like that. Um, I guess that kind of comes into another question. Um, Kyle, has there been any discussions on does this need to happen at the producer level or can it happen at the waste management level? So can we um, offer guidelines for, you know, say a lab stores this in a lot your area, you know, in a, and let's say like a lockbox kind of like has my material from a hospital, then that gets picked up and then it gets rendered unrecognizable and useless by responsible party or a lot of places want it to be done before it enters the waste stream. So like at the facility or has that not been discussed yet? I haven't had, heard any discussions on it. I'd love to hear Stephanie's perspective from how similar facilities in the hemp program did this before federal legalization on our pilot program and then you know billy i would love to hear your your thoughts and recommendations here yeah so from the hemp perspective um the organic material that's grown can be composted on site and or composted elsewhere um and then the food product um i think I mean, we don't, we don't, it gets regulated just like any other food product waste stream, but that this does kind of bring up an issue of the food, like in the state of Vermont, you can't throw away food, <laughs> it has to be, um, it can't be entered, it can't be put in the landfill. Um, so that brings up a question that I don't have an answer to. Um, and then we do not have expiration dates on product, on hemp products currently. Um, so that doesn't mean that there aren't any, we just don't have a requirement for it. Um, but I suspect that just gets managed like other trash. Uh, we don't have any special system within the HEP program. So it's just how other uh, ways it's managed. Um, but then it does, I have a question though as well, um, in addition, to, before we move on to Billy, um, the, the, the recyclable pieces of the waste once one consumed everything within it, um, have, did we decide that that can just enter regular, like res, res, residue isn't an issue, and those containers can just enter the regular waste stream how they would normally be managed? Did we arrive at that at least? We have not arrived at that, and that's where the, the kind of the packaging waste stream aspect of yep. that line was for us to discuss this. Okay. Okay. Sorry. So, yeah, so you know, we can discuss that right now. Um, we have not come to a conclusion on it. I feel pretty strongly that we're trying to, you know, look at the environmental impacts of this, uh, you know, industry that they should be able to be collected um, in a responsible manner um, and trying to move towards either reuse or recyclability of, of the products. So I think it's, I think it's important to allow for the collection of it given that there might be residue, but as long as it's, um, you know, overseen correctly, uh, I don't foresee any kind of public health or, or other issue around that. Yeah, I would start from the perspective of things that can be composted and recycled can and should be, and then if there's good cause um, from a public safety perspective for that not to happen, to kind of work back from there and see if there's fixes within the recycling and composting um, systems that can address those issues um, and kind of working our way back to the point where they would have to be disposed otherwise. Um, but I do think that's probably the call for the, the safety folks to make because um, I don't know what they're balanced. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it is just the 
no Jeremy Bosa other shit than he did. It was just, you know, the concern um, that I don't necessarily think is valid, but of having all these residues in one place, so having access to it. Actually, like, I think at, like, I just, at, like, a retail location, they would probably need to have, like, a locked facility, like, a locked dumpster or something like that, right, that people can't just jump into. But then once it gets mixed into the waste stream, either compost or recycling, or through a hauler or otherwise, then it's probably going to be so commingled with some of the other things, it's not going to be an issue, right? So that might be easy. And I'm sure there's lots of other places that have secure waste containers at their businesses. I know I used to work at a snowboard company many, many years ago, and we had dumpster divers who were always trying to get gloves and boots and whatnot, and we finally just put a lock on the dumpster, and, and that solved the problem. So, yeah. And I think that's going to be required. Um, I think you know, what we're seeing is that we're just starting to allow that this year was a collection of, uh, of these materials. So, like, the um, uh, plastic tubes that a lot of um, cannabis flowers sold in, and the big cartridges are not being able to be collected in the, at the retail outlets, and then um, there's one to two companies that are like collecting that to make sure that they are being recycled um, in an effort to kind of close the loop for plastics because most containers are kind of a number five. Um, and so there's um, been a big push to pelletize that and then use it and try and like, close that waste stream. And then um, the big cartridges is kind of, you know, the next frontier. It's a really difficult thing to be recycled, but trying to encourage the first thing I think is collecting it to encourage like a micro enterprise to come in and trying to um, do something with it. I know TerraCycle has a program only in Canada, but I think there's the, you know, the possibility of the CCB kind of you know advocating for you know some kind of reuse from it. It's just a, a very multi ingredient small product, um, but I think collecting it all at um, one point also helps the manufacturers. A lot of them are you know smaller than that two by two inch by two inch requirement that was discussed when we, when we did this. So I think at least allowing for the collection of it and then um, you know, figuring out who can actually you know, do something with it a post consumer would be good. Okay. Um, I think that was everything. Um, oh, yes, yes. Just, uh, just jump in. Like, I don't know how much like ongoing work the board is going to have looking at these issues kind of as the market matures, but certainly at any point, you know, we could bring in our solid waste folk to help kind of consult on like what options are. They have a pretty un- pretty good understanding of the existing uh, recycling and waste hauler players in the state. They could convene folks to talk through options. You know, my, my one caution is that I, I just am not convinced that the volume of material in Vermont, at least initially, is going to kind of be there to, to warrant some of these efforts. But who knows, maybe consumers will surprise me. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's that's kind of what it comes down to. I mean, I do believe there's going to be millions of pieces of plastic. You know, what that is in the scheme of things, not sure. Um, but I think trying to at least set up the regulations so that it is possible to um, you know, bring it into a more responsible waste stream, it would be important. And, and Billy, what, what I'm thinking is for my conversation with my other board members on Wednesday, I'm going to either later today or hopefully tomorrow, Jacob and I can kind of work to kind of put a bow on some of this this discussion that we've been having and that'll give David Chair, our general counsel, and Brent some direction on how, how to kickstart the rulemaking process and would love to bring in your experts if they have questions and trying to figure out um, certain directions the board wants to go down the road. That, that, that's like, that's kind of my general roadmap in my head. Okay. That makes sense. Great. Thank there, you. There's going to be, we've been, we've been careful with folks and with ourselves that we're trying to make decisions as a board right now, but they're just directional decisions, recognizing that there is going to be a lot more in the public input process as we move through rulemaking and some things could potentially change and the whole board will review all of the proposed rules once again with our com- with our subcommittees and, and advisory committees, if, if not every specific subcommittee, um, you know, before we actually post things. Right. Good. Um, all right, and then I guess I guess the last item would be, and it seems like we're in support of allowing for on-site composting for at least outdoor cultivations um, for the organic materials, similar to that. All right, um, and then, yeah, I guess moving on to the water discussion. Um, so 
that I reviewed kind of what you had sent from your team to Kyle last week, and it seems as though we're all in agreement that um, encouraging um, or requiring kind of the local permitting process, um, at least an affidavit that the water either sourcing or wastewater um, discharge um, is um, the capacity is there um, during the application process. So. Um, from both the municipal water side and the on water, um, on site water, um, and wastewater. So, is there anything else that needs to get teased out with this? I have one point of clar clarification on, on the way the board wanted to do a couple things, and it comes from the on site water side of the equation, Billy. The board thought is recognizing there's a lot of a lot of burdens on small cultivators. We thought that 20,000 gallon per day trigger. Um, was appropriate. Uh, if, if, it, if anybody's hitting that, they of course need to supply all of the information that Bruce recommended. Um, for small cultivators, they're not going to trigger that on the on-site part, part of our water discussion. It would be, if they want to supply us with that information, it would be included in that scoring sustainability matrix to strengthen their application, but not requiring it per se at the time of application. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's fine. I, and I was going to basically say something similar as that for kind of smaller scale on site water supply, I don't know that you really need to go through these right. questions. Um, you know, with, with the one caveat being surface water withdrawal, I think that was, you know, it, those, those volumes are really focused on groundwater, which right. is the typical way, right? You put a well in and you pull water from the ground. I think my understanding was the legislature had some questions and concerns about surface water withdrawals pulling from lakes and rivers. Um, so maybe you want to just have a question as to whether you're going to do that or not. Okay. Um, maybe that can be kind of, kind of, maybe that can be an added part of our application yeah. trying to recognize on-site water if it's coming from groundwater you we don't need to see more information but if you are doing surface water withdrawals we need to know a little bit more but but recognizing that that 20,000 foot or 25 employee threshold is something that's going to require a lot more information and then allowing folks to give us a lot of information up front so we understand things um, to better score their application from a priority perspective was kind of how we were thinking we could go I think that makes sense. Yeah, because these smaller operations are not really going to likely raise any sort of water supply on that water supply issues. That makes sense. Um, perfect. And then I think that's uh, uh, most of what we needed to cover today. And we do have some time. So I was wondering, um, Kyle, or other things that are quickly coming up um, on your plate that we should have a quick discussion about. You let me um, list my laundry list that's giving me a tad bit of consternation really quick that I'm okay. going to be talking about. Um, and a lot of it has to do with me having more conversations with folks. But So we're going to be talking about, or I'm going to be presenting um, for the purposes of this committee, waste disposal kind of directional um, signals for the board and for our rulemaking Wednesday, also baseline efficiency standards. So I know we had been kind of gotten what 80 85 percent of uh, PSD's recommendations. I didn't know if it was worth trying to um, come to an agreement or a consensus. That I think the last thing, to, if, and I don't have the document in front of me, Jacob, the last thing we needed to talk about was this data collection um, piece of the. The recommendations that was kind of something that was left outstanding um, but I want to make sure that I have good understanding of how Billy and, and Stephanie feel when it comes to efficiency standards and, and where we are with with PSD's recommendations with the VOCs PSD the PSD recommendations. yeah, not, oh, yeah, necessarily yeah. On, not necessarily on air but um, energy efficiency yeah, so where we left off the energy efficiency is um, everything we pretty much approved according to PSD. The only outstanding item on that was the, um, I want to say it was the 3.4 BTUs per square foot for, uh, exemption requirement for greenhouses um, that we weren't sure was actually going to be achievable um, by, by anyone um, for like the heating um, aspect of it. Uh, but everything else, I think we, we had approved, and then where we were um, 
unsure, but I think we had agreement on was the collection, the collecting of information. Um, for that, we were in favor of as long as the CCB or whoever was collecting was actually being used, and so it wasn't just you know an onerous um, you know like a burden on on coal goods to like small coal graders if nothing was going to happen from that. Um, and then to leaving kind of the open-ended collection um, or if it was two years or three years or five years, that would be up to you guys or whoever was collecting it. Um, so I think we kind of came up with uh, an agreement there. Um, but yeah, my understanding was there was just like one outstanding item um, on, on the, most of the energy efficiency requirements. Yeah, that's my recollection too. And if, if folks, I know Jacob had done some outreach to cultivators trying to recognize whether or not they could hit that um, that standard that PSD had developed. I know PSD did their did their best recognizing they don't have a lot of expertise as it relates specifically to this this crop and I'd I'd be in favor of proposing to my fellow board members the the adjusted language that Jacob had provided. Um, and Jacob if you wouldn't mind reading that again because I don't have the document in front of me. Um, as the with one of the caveats to PSD's recommendations. Um yeah me by the way, so approve is written. Um, so what we have is the yeah the indoor opaque wall building energy standard recommendations. Um, so that was kind of exactly what the PSD had done. So as far as the building envelope, the lighting, and the HVAC um, from the greenhouse energy standard recommendations, uh, we are in agreement with the building envelope being a minimum of. Uh, U factor 0.7, um, the lighting as well at 1.7, um, PPE, HVAC, um, and then the low lighting load um, exemption for greenhouses. So anything less than 40 kW um, connected. And then um, we also agreed with changing the language from growing to cultivation to be in line with. Um, uh, Act 164, and then um, the requirements for when um, they need to get to the, the different levels would be for uh, space conditioning systems, um, dehumidification, uh, essentially if it's an additional space or a change in usage, and then the benchmark requiring requirements we were uh, we recommend cultivation facilities provide annual data to the CCB um, on energy consumption by fuel source um, or energy source on a monthly basis, um, as, as well as water consumption. Again, it's by weight so you can get an actual metric, uh, benchmarking metric. And then, so the only thing we didn't do that is like what the timing of that would be. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we have the low energy building exemption with the just unknown on whether we should include the 10.7 watts per meter square or the equivalent of 3.4 BTUs per hour per square foot. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then we approved the other uh, equipment efficiencies that they threw in at the end of that. So that's like for fans and pumps. So, um, yeah, pretty much everything um, else has been approved. I mean, I think there's a few other things here that I did not go through, um, you know, post-meeting. Once I, like, type this up, I guess, again, for everyone. Is that what you wanted, Kyle? Yeah, I just want to make sure that we're all still in consensus that that's a direction. A lot of that's probably more granular than what the board needs at this time. It can be developed through rulemaking, but we want to make sure that we're in agreement that PSD's recommendations for the most part are are very, you know, spot on with some caveats through continued outreach um, with cannabis specific sp cannabis specific enterprises, organizations and cultivators to make some adjustments so that folks can achieve higher than the regulatory floor and take advantage of some efficiency efficiency rebates and incentives that might be offered through other state partners. I guess what would be 
helpful like Billy and Stephanie would be for these like sustainability metrics, sustainability kind of going above and beyond the, the floor that we're setting. Um, do you have ideas on how to like, incentivize this? Um, I know the CCB is talking about doing a priority licensing process, but is there any other state incentive programs um, or like programs that other um, agencies are doing to kind of incentivize a more sustainable, you know, location, a more sustainable system that we can essentially, you know, use to encourage um, cultivators and manufacturers? Um, just at the Agency of Agriculture, um, not related to energy efficiency, or actually in any kind of product probably, you, you know, there's that marketing piece where you incentivize it because you get to label your product a particular way or otherwise publicize or um, market your product with a label of <laughs> a particular kind. Um, so that's... You know, I, I think that's just standard across any kind of um, product, um, and that's the only thing that I'm aware of. I know Efficiency Vermont has annual awards. Um, I think primarily focused around like building efficiency for new construction, but they may be an entity that does rank and score these sorts of efforts. Um, we, you know, the state used to do like some green business awards, but I think we've kind of wind that down. But I can look into it to see if that's still something that's happening. Um, would it make sense? I'm imagining if, as applications are rolling in, there's going to be a bit of a strain on like technical assistance. Um, most likely from your department staff and aid. So I'm wondering if there is potentially an incentive of if you do score high on your sustainability metrics, you could potentially, you know, get in to see someone sooner or get on the top of the list. Um, you know, or is that just gonna be kind of confusing to actually roll out or difficult to roll out? Um, well I you know I assistance from the agency relative to like pesticide regulation, I'm actually not clear what assistance the agency is providing. Um, um, there's, there's like technical assistance, so yeah, on um, either cultivation guidance for pesticide use, or if you need to get like a, a pesticide application permit, you know, or anything kind of dealing with with your agency or some of the resources that they'd be using. If you know you score, you get a gold star on the sustainability thing, and you would get, you know, preferred scheduling or something like that, so you're not waiting, you know, months, you're just thinking of other non-tax-based incentives. That, that yeah. I mean, we haven't had that conversation in our agency. We typically just address requests for information on a as needed basis from, you know, from any program in the agency. Um, so it would take some time to have that conversation with folks, and it would have to be somewhat coordinated across multiple divisions. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. What? I certainly entertain that question. Um, but we don't do that for anybody else. So I don't know that we would. I mean, we just like to provide the best customer service generally to everybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's yeah, I just pulled out right. and then I'm just trying to think out of the box. So. I know, I know, I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, that was that was something that Jacob and I kind of talked about because again, I can foresee how prioritizing and, and going above and beyond and getting that sustainability score will be very beneficial, especially to outdoor growers that want to get their plants in the ground ASAP this coming season, but over the course of, as our, and again, as our market matures and those bottlenecks aren't going to be as real um, as they will be this coming spring, what are other incentives other than, than tax-based incentives that Jacob said that, that will push people into wanting to provide us this information um, and be in, in this gold star club or whatever we may call it down the road if we go in that direction um, to, to pull people with carrots into a more craft market, you know? I'm thinking here, I, I don't have an answer. 
I'm not asking. I don't think. I don't think you need one at this moment. I just want to put the bug in in both of your ears on ways that if we were to do, develop some type of matrix over the next couple months to include in our application, um, what are incentives that we can can tell folks, hey, if you give us this information, you're going to get, you know, and you know, there's there's other things that we can do. Like if if you do run into uh, an enforcement um, issue, maybe you're still looked upon favorably within the CCB and, and with our partner organizations, but, but what else, you know, what else can we provide as a state recognizing we can only do that in various ways? And this is over and above the baseline standard. This is just priority, priority um, information that you could give us that would help facilitate your application through the process if you you know I don't think in our baseline application we're going to ask a cultivator about every single one of their cultivation practices I mean but that's something that I've got to discuss with the board so if there's any thoughts that you all have on what we should ask at, at that operational level would be helpful but this is like you know what certifications are, are you going to work with a third party certifier are you going to get audited what what are you willing to do outside of regulation to show us that you're going for a top quality product i can share with you a copy of a document that um heather darby put together that helps outdoor cultivation like it, it's more or less a spreadsheet, like where what information you should be collecting in order to be a good cultivator. Um, I, I can share that with you. Um, that might be a, a starting point. Um, and then I did share the Vermont Environmental Stewardship Program, the ESP, which is run by Water Quality Division. And there's a tool in there that's specifically focused on soil. Um, and then there's some other stuff um, in that program. That is it's funded with federal dollars and wouldn't it be applicable for this program but there appears to be some other standards available where you, you where the board could potentially make an assessment that someone's over you know operating over and above um, baseline sustainability requirements okay yeah it almost, it almost seems like if there's like an industry group that you could partner with or you know somehow have it become like a promotional and marketing kudo that you know that would be the most effective strategy it's tough as a regulator to do it you know it seems like some third party could be the one that could kind of create that with you um, yeah you know, there's obviously ways to certify for organic and Vermont products and all those things but um, those have their own kind of requirements yeah, absolutely. I think we're not trying to overcomplicate or think that we, we have that expertise in-house. I'm just trying to mar marry that recognition with some of our legislative mandates on prioritizing sustainability. Um, one of the things we were thinking of from a marketing standpoint, it doesn't have to do with sustainability necessarily, but, um, you know, we're a small, and I don't know how it fits into the licensing scheme with um, cannabis, but like a small craft grower that, you know, both grows and manufactures and, you know, does a lipid extraction and makes products all in the same location, you know, like that's kind of like a, a little boutique, some or other um, operation that could get a, a marketing a label requirement and then you could also build in some sustainability components to that like when it's all location based um but i don't know just thinking yeah, yeah. well we're not going to make any like go ahead adding some of these into like applications yeah. program as well i was thinking about that and just adding in sustainability practices as part of the requirements I mean, all products are going to be Vermont-based. I mean, not maybe not every ingredient within a product, but obviously it's not coming across the border, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's like with the Appalachian, at least like what we're seeing in California, but I think it's kind of leading that charge as like the local um, practices that aspect to it. So like while it is being 
grown local is also according to you know Tawar and things like that. So it's really like more for outdoor greenhouse growers, but um, we'll also kind of like the different um, cannabis practices. I think when it comes to like harvesting and curing and drying that are like Vermont based that have kind of been established in the legacy market as well. You know, so kind of like what Vermont's been known for doing. I mean, you can even open this up to your growers to be like, hey, pitch something for us. So let me know how you feel about it. And then at least it's driven by the community rather than by us. <laughs> yeah, I do like that. Yeah, no, it's conceptual in nature at the moment. It's something that we'll be exploring over the course of the next couple months while we develop our application. So but that's all I got for right now. Jacob, you and I should connect later today or tomorrow. Make sure I've got the good direction of the subcommittee when I talk about certain things with the board um, over the course of this week. Absolutely. Yeah. And then um, I'll, I'll pass around the, the meeting management today's meeting, the last meeting um, as well. And then as I started putting together some of these guides, um, I'll be sharing with uh, with everyone um, for, for inputs and stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll take it from there. Okay. Uh, we I don't need any public commenting real quick before we go. I don't think we have anybody that, that has a public comment in the room. Okay, perfect. Well, then we'll adjourn the meeting at uh, 1 o'clock. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you. You guys. Bye. Take care.